Today's biblical story continues the story that Luke has been telling us about Jesus' ministry in Galilee. You recall last week he had returned to Capernaum, the town where his ministry in Galilee was based for most of those three years. And an extraordinary act had healed the servant or the slave of a centurion without ever going near him. <clears throat> Just by speaking the word, the servant was healed. Now, soon afterwards, he went to a town called Maine. And his disciples and a great crowd followed him there. And when he came to the gate of the town, a man who had died was being carried out. Now, he was his mother's only son. And she was a widow. And there was also a great crowd following them. Now when Jesus saw her, he had compassion for her. And he said to her, do not weep. Then he stepped forward and touched the funeral bier. And the bearers stood still. Then he said to the dead man, young man, I say to you, rise. And immediately the dead man sat up and began to speak. Fear seized all of them. And then they began to praise God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has looked with favor on his people. And the word about him spread through all Judea and all the surrounding country. Did you get the mental picture of two processions? Jesus with a crowd following him on that long walk from Capernaum down to Dan. And as they arrive at the city gate, a funeral procession is making its way out. I've seen and been in my share of funeral processions. Don't know about you, my guess is I've had to go to more than most folks. It's the nature of the work when you're in ministry. You know, every once in a while down here in Texas, in our postmodern culture, postmodern and Texas don't quite go together, do they? <laughs> but the changes in our culture are such that it's rare, but it happens every once in a while when a funeral procession is coming towards me, I'll see the cars ahead of me pull off to the side and stop. Doesn't happen often anymore, but every time it does, and I always pull aside and stop, but it takes me back. In my day, like the old guy says, back in small towns in Kentucky or wherever, probably in Texas, years ago, you didn't dare drive past a funeral procession. It was a sign of respect for the family of the deceased that you paused, no matter what kind of hurry you were in, and out of respect, allowed the procession to pass. Some of those processions were sadder than others. They're all sad. But in that broad array of experiences with funerals, the ones that come at the end of a long, full life, while the grief is real, are nothing like the grief of a child taken from his parents. Certain memories, no matter how long ago they are, still stay vividly etched. In Perryville, Kentucky, the funeral procession went down through the main street and at the intersection turned to the left out towards the cemetery. Gene Underwood, a deacon in our church, couldn't come to the funeral the day of Long's funeral, but stood in the door of his grocery store with tears in his eyes because of the tragedy of a teenager in our church who died in a traffic accident. The custom of reopening the casket after the funeral in practice in that day was an unfortunate one because George and his mother literally clung to his body until we had to pull her off of his body in the casket. Crying and wailing, Mama loves you. The death of pain of the mother who loses a child. Memories like that are the backdrop for picturing what's going on in today's biblical story. Jesus encounters a widow whose only son has died. And in the setting of the ancient world, that was an even more intense tragedy than 
the one I'm remembering vividly, or perhaps ones that you can remember out of our life experience. A deeper tragedy even than a parent losing a child in the ancient world was a widow losing the last of her children, meaning that she was in a condition of utter desperation. And unless there was some intervention by someone who didn't have to do so, being at risk of lifelong poverty, there were no social security systems in place in the ancient world. <clears throat> Only whatever degree of compassion there was in the community for the care of widows and orphans. And it could not be assured or anticipated that we would ever serve. Luke tells us that when Jesus saw her, he was moved with compassion. The Greek word splagnizo is a powerful one. It's rather earthy. It literally means your bowels turn over. Compassion isn't an intellectual experience. It's a visceral experience. It's in the ancient understanding that that's where your emotions live, in your guts. Jesus felt it in his guts, had compassion for her, and as a result of that said the most extraordinary thing. Stop crying. Do not weep. Now, I doubt that he shouted it, but the words themselves are astounding and at face value outlandish. I can't help but thinking back over all the funerals I've conducted, all the mourning loved ones I've sought to comfort, even Georgia and her depth of pain at Vaughn's funeral. Could I ever in the world imagine saying to her or to them, stop crying, do not weep? But that's what Jesus says here. If I adopted that practice as a pastor, my days as a pastor would be numbered, I would think. <laughs> and yet Jesus here is not acting as pastor, but as prophet. Not as one who's responding to life as it is, but one who's ushering in life as it will be. And he speaks in the power of God and in the tradition of the prophets who have gone before him. Remember that after he speaks to the man and he gets up and speaks himself, and everyone's astonished and amazed, they don't say how good it is that he's back to life, or even how good it is that she's had her son restored. They say a great prophet has risen among us. Because for everyone with eyes to see and ears to hear, someone showing up on the scene and bringing the dead to life meant that what God had done in the days of the prophets was being renewed and fulfilled in their experience as well. Luke's community certainly heard this story against the backdrop of this story. This next story. Oh, that's that story. <laughs> <laughs> One of the stories about the great prophet Elijah, the first and foremost of the prophets, who in the land of Israel was suffering along with the rest of the people of Israel because God had caused famine to come across the land. No rain for three years and six months. <coughs> Food was scarce to none. And the prophet was at risk of starving to death along with the rest of the people. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, saying, Go now to Zarephath, which is over in Sidon, and live there, for I have ordered a widow there to feed you. So Elijah set out and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the town, there was a widow there gathering sticks. He called her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel so that I can drink. As she was going to get it, he called again and said, And uh, bring me a morsel of bread in your hand so I can eat. The woman said to him, Sir, as the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked. Only a little bit of grain in a jar and a small amount of oil in a jug. Now I'm gathering these sticks so that I can take it home and prepare this for my son and myself so we can eat it and then die. But Elijah said to her, do not be afraid. Go and do as you have said, but 
first bring a cake up here to me so that I can eat, and then afterwards make something for yourself and for your son also to eat. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of grain will not be empty, nor will the jug of oil fail until the Lord brings rain upon the earth. So she went and did as Elijah had said. And she and he and her household ate for many days. The jar of grain was never empty. The jug of oil never failed, according to the word of the Lord, which he had spoken through the prophet Elijah. Now afterwards, the son, the son of the widow, the mistress of the house, became ill, so ill, that he lost all of his breath. There was no breath left in him. And the widow said to Elijah, have you come to bring my sin to remembrance, O man of God? Have you come so that God might strike my son dead? But Elijah took the child from the bosom and carried him up to the upper chamber of the house where he was staying, and he laid him on his own bed. Then Elijah prayed to the Lord his God, O oh Lord my God, Indeed, have you inflicted suffering on this widow with whom I'm saying by killing her son? And more passionately, as he stretched himself out over the body of the child three times, he cried out and prayed again to the Lord, O oh Lord my God, let this child's life return to him. And the Lord heard the prayer of Elijah, and he granted what he'd asked. And the life went into the boy again, and he was revived. And Elijah gathered him up in his arms and brought him down into the house and gave him to his mother and said, See, here is your son. And the woman said, Now I know that indeed you are a prophet of the true God, and that the word of the Lord that is in your mouth is the truth. You hear the similarity in the two stories. Can you imagine that the people who first heard this story missed the obvious comparisons, the obvious similarity? A widow at the gate of the town, in a condition of desperation, with the last of her children gone. A deed of power by God's servant that brings the child to life, and the declaration that gives praise and glory to God the sign that God was clearly alive at work in the life of the people. So for the people in Maine on that day, it was something far broader with deeper impact than just simply the resuscitation of a young man's life. The mother, the widow, is restored to life. The people see God's power at work in their midst and what had been long awaited the deeds of power as those done by Elijah to be the sign that the Messiah was coming into their midst. And though they were not at full recognition of who he was, they were well on the way to say, a great prophet has risen among us, and God has looked favorably at his people. Well, to cut Jesus some slack for not being such a sensitive pastor, as I was talking a while ago, think about it. When you are imbued with the power of God, as the prophets before you had been, when you have the power with the word to restore life, sometimes just the sharp declaration of that word is sufficient, especially in those circumstances that we humans have a tendency to be about, in which we can sometimes become so bogged down in our frailty, in our sorrow, in our anxiety, in our fears, clear message that says, stop crying, needs to be heard in a way that restores life. Kind of an ironic extreme of this was fulfilled in what I consider a classic comedy sketch. 
You'll notice in a minute the familiar comedian Bob Newmark. You probably remember his old show in which he was a psychiatrist. This is a later version on Mad TV where he's a psychiatrist again in a therapy session, which he explains is done easily in five minutes for five dollars. And this is the word that he has to say to this person. Tell me about the problem and if you wish to address it. Oh, okay. Uh, well, I have the fear of being buried alive in a box. <laughs> <laughs> I just I start thinking about being buried alive and I begin to panic. Has, has, has anyone ever, ever tried to, to bury you alive in a box? No. No, but... Truly thinking about it does make my life horrible. I mean, I can't go through tunnels or be in an elevator or in a house, anything boxy. So what, what you're saying is you're, you're claustrophobic. Uh, yes, yes, that's it. <laughs> All right, well, let's go, Catherine. I'm, uh, I'm going to uh, say two words to you right now. I, I want you to listen to them very, very carefully. Then I want you to take them out of the office with you and incorporate them in, into your life. Shall I uh, write them down? Well, if, if it makes you comfortable, it's just two words. Most, we find most people can, uh, can remember. <laughs> okay. You ready? Yes. Okay, here, here they are. Stop it! <laughs>
a world in which God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Neither shall there be sorrow or sighing or pain anymore for those former things have passed away. We who claim relationship with Jesus Christ, we who claim to be his brothers and sisters, his disciples, are in a sense commissioned to live in that power and with those to whom we minister and as we minister to one another, to be attuned to those moments when the time to stop crying comes and to live in the depth of that greater power is upon us. In our personal lives, there's plenty of cause to cry. In our life together as a church, when we think about the changes, the loss, the aspects of being church that are no more, the solid place that is not ours now, and the unknowns still ahead as to where we will be, boy, believe me, it's real easy to whine and to cry, and I do my share of it, and I listen to my share of it, and I can hear in the background, if I stretch real hard, <coughs> the voice of one who says, do not weep, or even the more strident voice of one who says, stop it! Not meant to be mean, but meant to jar us into the perspective that our sole claim to vitality in life as a people is to be a resurrection people. To be those who have been empowered by that resurrection and who are called to live it out in our lives. Yes, there is uncertainty about where we are and where we're going, but there also is energy and excitement and promise of God doing a new thing in our midst and of us being risen up in new ways that we cannot yet fully see or imagine, but that we can trust because of the very nature of God who leads us and God's trustworthiness and faithfulness that we have always known and are confident again to be fulfilled. To live as those who know the message of the resurrection is in a sense to have always, even in the most dark moments and the most somber funeral, to have a word to speak that ultimately says, do not weep, get up, be restored to life. Tony Campolo talks about the event that persuaded him to join the predominantly African American Baptist Church in Philadelphia that he continues to be part of and to serve as one of their associate pastors along with his broad-based career as a teacher, lecturer, author. Talks about going there as a teenager when his friend Clarence had died suddenly, tragically, much like the funeral I was talking about before and remembering. But he tells the most vivid story about that event, about how that preacher came down among the people and took the hand of the grieving mother and offered God's word of comfort from scripture and then invited others to remember and tell stories about Clarence, his kindness, his compassion, what a gift he had been among them. And then goes to the casket itself. In those days, the casket opened still in the service and said to Clarence, Clarence, you left us too soon. Our hearts are broken, but we entrust you to God's care. And now, after all is said and done, it's time for us to say goodnight to Clarence. And he stood over the casket, and he said in a loud voice, Good night, Clarence. Good night, Clarence. And the second time, slammed the lid of the casket down. An audible gasp could be heard through the whole congregation. And then Kevin Campolo says he looked up at the church and he smiled. And said, We've told Clarence good night, but I know, I know that God is telling Clarence good morning. And at that word, the choir rose up and began singing, In that great, give no morning, we will rise, we will rise. The congregation stood and began singing. People were dancing in the aisles, and Tony Campolo said it was in that moment he knew this was the church he wanted to be a part of. If God's Spirit could be alive and at work in such a way that a funeral became a celebration. Much as the procession in New Orleans goes in a dirge to the funeral, but with colorful umbrellas and dancing in the streets on the return period. So also, we on our own journey of faith, no matter the depth of our tears, are ultimately called to hear that message of good news. 
And in the words of the ancient psalmist, those who sow in tears will return with shouts of joy, bringing our sheaves with us. In that spirit, even in our most exhausted moments, may we give ourselves to God and hear God's message in the life.